In this video, I'm going to be talking about a super interesting topic known as focal length. Now, what is focal length? As always, it's better explained with an illustration. Now, I have my camera's lens over here and my camera's lens is mounted onto a camera's body like this. Now, one thing to know about the camera's lens is that it's just a lens body with a lot of glass lenses inside. And obviously, we have our camera sensor inside the body. Now, to keep things simple, I'm just going to be focusing on the backmost glass lens present inside the body of the lens. Now, as we know, light rays have to travel through the camera's lens and converge at the camera's sensor. That's how you create an image. And this distance that the light ray has to travel from the camera's lens before converging at the sensor is known as the focal length. Put simply, focal length is the distance between the camera's lens and the camera's sensor. And it is measured in millimeters. Now, this is a 50 millimeter lens. And if this is mounted onto my camera's lens, it means that there will be 50 millimeters of distance between this backmost glass lens and the camera sensor. Camera lenses are divided into three types based on focal length. They are wide lenses, normal lenses and telephoto lenses. Wide lenses are lenses which provide a small focal length of up to 35 millimeters. A 50 millimeter lens is considered to be a normal lens because that 50 millimeter focal length is the closest focal length to the human eye. And uh, every lens with a focal length above 75 millimeters is considered to be a telephoto lens. I'll explain what these are. Camera lenses are also divided into two other types based on their body. They are prime lenses and zoom lenses. Prime lenses are lenses like this one which provide a fixed focal length. Whereas zoom lenses are lenses in which the focal length can be changed like this. This is a lens in which the focal length can be changed from 55 millimeters all the way up to 250 millimeters. This is possible because there is a mechanism inside the lens which helps you move the glass lenses present inside the lens body back and forth. Therefore, increasing the distance between the backmost glass lens and the camera sensor. Now we know what focal length is. But why does focal length matter? While exposure triangle uh, decides how bright your image looks, the focal length basically decides what your camera sees and also how it sees it. When used properly, you can use focal length to create optical illusions to change the very perception of things in your images. And focal length affects your images in three different ways. One is through field of view, two is through perspective or compression, and three is through depth of field. I'm gonna talk about field of view first. But before I begin, I want you to do an experiment. I want you to hold your hand like this and take it closer to your eye. And when you see through this gap between your hands, you can see that you can see a lot of things through this gap. Now move your hand a little bit to the uh, front and now you can see that the amount of area that you can see through this gap reduces. And as you move your hand even more and more to the front, the amount of area that you can see through this gap reduces more and more. Now this is exactly how focal length affects field of view. Now the field of view is just the amount of area that the camera sensor can see. And when you change your focal length, the camera's lens is moving more and more to the front and therefore it reduces the field of view for the sensor. When you use a nice wide lens, the camera sensor basically distorts the image to fit in that huge wide landscape, huge wide area into one image. This distortion is more most prominent in fisheye lenses and ultra wide lenses, which have focal lengths of up to 24 millimeters. Fisheye and ultra wide lenses are just types of wide lenses. Now I'm going to talk about perspective. Perspective can be defined as a point of view or the perception of something. And when you use focal length properly, you can actually create optical illusions to change the very perception of things. And compression is just a byproduct of perspective. It can be defined as how the uh, distance between two objects is perceived in an image. Now, for example, you have let's say that you have an object A and you have an object B. When you use a nice wide focal length to take an image of these two objects, the distance between these two objects seems a little exaggerated. But 
when you use a telephoto lens, the distance between these two objects gets compressed. Let me demonstrate what I mean by that. Take a look at this video. This is a bottle of oil at 18 millimeters. Now it's obvious that when I zoom in, the field of view decreases when I increase my focal length. But if I move back while maintaining the same angle and the same focal length, watch what happens. In case you could not spot the difference, here's an image of the same bottle of oil shot at 18 millimeters, and here is an image of the same bottle shot at 55 millimeters. Notice how in the first image you get a nice perspective view of things and how the overall bottle seems taller, while in the second image the entire bottle seems shorter and compressed and the distance between the top and the bottom of the bottle seems reduced and there's not much difference in the sizes from the top to the bottom of the bottle. Here's another example of a flower vase kept in front of a nail polish bottle. At 18 millimeters, you can see that the distance between these two objects is pretty long. While in the second image, which was shot at 250 millimeters, you can see that the distance between them is almost negligible. If it weren't for the depth of field blurring out the nail polish bottle, you would think that they were both in the same line. Now let's try this same experiment on a live model. This is my dog. Now at 18 millimeters, notice how his snout seems longer, how his nose is more nearer to the camera while his forehead seems farther away from his nose and away from the camera. The same image at 55 millimeters, you can see that his no his face seems a lot smaller. There's a reason why photo professional photographers tend to use large focal lengths like 85 millimeters or uh, 105 millimeters when shooting portraits. This is because unless that is the look that you are going for, the distortions on the face caused by a wide lens like in the first image here is not really preferred on a person's face. Now I'm going to talk about depth of field. I am back with this diagram and uh, if you watch the previous part, you know what's happening here. Light from this point is going through the lens and converging at the sensor and you have the minimum point of focus over there in the pink line. Now how focal length affects depth of field is very very similar to how distance affects depth of field. Only that instead of actually moving your whole camera back and forth, you are just moving your lens back and forth. Notice what happens when I move my lens forward. You could see that when I move my lens forward, my depth of field became more shallower. My pink line moved closer towards the point. And when I move my lens back again, you can see that my depth of field increases. Therefore, I get a nice larger depth of field. So put simply, when you use a larger focal length, you get more depth of field. That is, you get more blur. And when you use a smaller focal length, you get less depth of field. So a 200 millimeter lens focusing at a point will have a more shallower depth of field than a 24 millimeter lens focusing at that same point. An example for depth of field would be this same image. Notice how in the second image, which was shot at 250 millimeters, there is so much more blur in the background when compared to the first image on the left, which was shot at 18 millimeters. Now you know what focal length is and how it affects your image. But there is just one more thing that you need to know, which is known as the effective focal length. Now the effective focal length can be defined as what focal length you get to use. Let me explain. Now the focal length of a camera lens cannot be changed no matter what. Now if this lens is 50 millimeters, this lens will be 50 millimeters no matter what. But the focal length that you get to use in your camera depends on the sensor that you are using because there are different types of camera sensors. Yes, there are two types. There are full frame camera sensors and there are crop sensors. Now full frame camera sensors are the original 36 millimeter camera sensors. Almost every camera lens is built for a full frame camera sensor. A crop sensor is basically a smaller version of the full frame sensor. And how small is it? Well, that depends on the brand of the camera that you're using because Canon crop sensors are smaller than Nikon crop sensors and I think Sony is smaller than all of them. Anyways, the upside of using a full frame sensor is that your image tends to be more brighter and the upside of using a crop sensor is that crop sensors tend to provide more depth of field. 
When you use a full frame sensor, you get to utilize the full focal length of your lens. So if I'm using this lens on a full frame camera, I get to use the entire full 50 millimeter that this lens provides me. But however, when I use a crop sensor, there is something known as the crop factor. Now the crop factor is basically a ratio of the crop sensor's size when compared to the full frame sensor. And as I told you, it varies from brand to brand. Nikon crop sensors have a crop factor of 1.5 because they are 1.5 times smaller than the full frame sensor. And Canon cameras crop sensors have a crop factor of 1.6. So what is my effective focal length? What is the focal length that I get to use if I'm using this 50 millimeter lens on a Nikon camera with a crop sensor? Well, it's actually pretty easy to calculate. You just have to multiply the focal length of the lens with the crop factor of that sensor, which is 50 into 1.5, which gives you 75. So if I'm using this 50 millimeter lens on a camera with a Nikon crop sensor, it would be the equivalent of me using a 75 millimeter lens on a full frame camera sensor. Now that's enough theory. Now let's take a look at some images where focal length has been put to use nicely. Now in this image, a nice wide lens has been used to cover the entire ocean and you have these clouds in the background and you can see the distance from going from the foreground to the background and uh, because of that you can see that the sun is very small in the background. In this image you can see that the sun is pretty big. This is because a large focal length has been used to compress the distance between this tree in the foreground and the sun in the background to make it look like they are pretty close to each other and that makes the sun look big. This effect is most prominent in wildlife photographs where photographers use huge 600 millimeter or 800 millimeter lenses to take photographs. It does not just happen with the sun. Another example would be cityscapes. So when you use a wide lens, like in this image, you get to see a wide area and also you get this distance between this these buildings and you can also see a nice perspective in this image. But when you decide to go far away from the buildings and use a large focal length like this image, notice how this image seems a lot more flatter, a lot more compressed without any perspective due to the compression caused by using a large focal length. Now let's head into Blender and see how we can use all this knowledge inside Blender. Right, we're now inside Blender and I'm using the brand new Blender 2.91. And if you don't have it already, go and download it, it's amazing. Without further ado, I'm gonna select my camera and uh, enter camera view by hitting zero in the number pad and then go into camera settings. I wanna talk about the camera settings a little. So if you wanna use real life camera measurements, then your type needs to remain in perspective at all times. And now you have your focal length, which is obvious. If you want to use a wide lens, you just have to reduce your focal length and you get a wide lens up to one millimeter and uh, you can increase the focal length to go as telephoto as you would like. And then you have something called the lens unit, which provides you with two options, either millimeters or field of view. Now millimeters is the unit which is used in real life camera lenses, but Blender also provides field of view, which I am really not comfortable with. It's basically what the sensor sees and it's measured in angles. I keep I use millimeters at all times. Uh, you have Shift X and Shift Y, which is used in camera motion, about which I will be talking about talking about in part five of this series. So stay tuned. Now these are not all the settings that I want to talk about. There are more. There is something more that I want to show you. Now there is a reason why I talked about things like effective focal length and uh, sensor size and everything. Because when you are trying to composite your VFX scene or uh, just your 3D models onto your raw footage, which you shot with any camera in the world, you actually need your VFX shot to have the same sensor size to be shot in the same camera as the camera that you shot the raw footage with because that is going to help you composite seamlessly and perfectly and it is possible to record your vfx shot in blender with the same camera with the same sensor that you used in real world 
There is something known as the camera settings and this provides you with sensor settings. By default, it should be in sensor fit auto and size of 36 millimeters. This is a full frame sensor. So by default in Blender, you are using a full frame camera. You can change that by selecting the either the changing either the horizontal value or you can change it by using the vertical value. Now you don't always have to know the actual sensor size and input it manually over here because Blender provides you with presets and uh, you can and Blender provides presets for almost all cameras from Ari, Alexa to Blackmagic to GoPros to iPhones to Samsung Galaxies. For example, I'm going to be selecting Samsung Galaxy S4 over here and you can see that my camera sensor has changed to 4.8 millimeters, which is the actual size for Samsung Galaxy S4 camera sensor. And if I select an iPhone 5, you can see that my sensor has changed very little when compared to Samsung Galaxies. But if I change to a red Epic, you can see that my sensor size has become very big or if I go and use a black magic production camera over here, you can see that my sensor size is now 21.12 millimeters. This is a pretty good, pretty amazing feature that Blender provides. And if you want to add more presets by yourself, you can add them over here. So everything is possible in Blender now, man. Now I'm going to be showing you how to achieve a zoom burst effect inside Blender. Zoom burst is an effect which is achieved when you use a slow shutter speed and zoom in during the same time, which gives you a nice uh, vortex getting sucked in kind of feeling. And now let's recreate this in Blender. So I've created a simple scene with a uh, Suzanne in the middle, six spheres around Suzanne with Two of them have white emission textures, uh, two of them have red emission textures and two of them have a simple black diffuse texture. There is one light in my scene and I've set my camera in a way that Suzanne is in the center of my camera. It is important that your subject stays in the middle of your camera because the edges get the most distorted, the center get is the area which gets the least distorted. So with that done, I'm going to select my camera. I'm going to set a keyframe for the focal length at uh, frame one. I'm going to keep it at something like 35 millimeters. No, I'm going to go for 24 millimeters. And I'm going to set a keyframe for that. And I might go to frame 10 and uh, set a keyframe for maybe 75 millimeters. And I'll set a keyframe for that there. And um, I'll make sure to change the interpolation mode to linear so that there's no speeding up. And I might select a nice frame like maybe frame 8 and I'm going to enable motion blur. And uh, center on frame is good and I'm going to keep it as a one second shutter. With that done, I'm going to give this image a render. This is my render and I am not happy with it. So I went back and uh, changed the second keyframe from 75 millimeters to 105 millimeters and re-rendered it. And this time I was really happy with the result. You can see that Suzanne's nose is very sharp while the edges of her face have this zoom burst effect happening. And uh, you can see that as we get away from the center of the frame, the effect gets more stronger. So you, zoom burst is a pretty cool technique that you can use to bring in a sense of thrill or urgency into your renders. Now I'm going to show you how to recreate the dolly zoom effect or the vertigo effect in Blender to add in some magic to your renders. I have a pretty simple scene set up over here with Suzanne in front of a few pillars. I then set up my camera at a very far distance from my model and used a large focal length to make sure that my model fills up the screen. I set a keyframe for the focal length at the first frame and then I added in an empty to act as my camera's rig and parented my camera to the empty. I set a keyframe for the empty's location at the first frame. At frame 120, I took my empty closer to the model 
and set a keyframe for its location over there. I then went into the camera view and lowered the keyframe to make sure that my subject remains the same size that it was at frame 1. Now if the animation is played, you can see the dolly zoom effect happening. With that, we have reached the end of part 3 from the Blender Camera Masterclass. Hi, I'm sorry that this part came out almost a week late but there was a cyclone where I live and I couldn't record because of that and after that my laptop's hard disk crashed and I just got it fixed. Anyways, the final two parts from the Blender Camera Masterclass will be out this week and to make sure that you don't miss out on that, please hit the subscribe button. Also, if you like what I do, please hit the subscribe button because that would really really support me. And if you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up so that more people can find it. And also, please let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I would love to hear them. So I will see you in the next part. Bye.